some months ago, we were uh, sent a painting and uh, a fascinating text that had been in uh, uh, critical military matters uh, by Karl Gopal Krishnan, who's just popped up on the screen. It's now 4 a.m. in the morning, and uh, our thinking was that any man who is prepared to talk to us <laughs> at 4 a.m. in the morning is going to be a man worth listening to. And I'm fascinated personally by uh, Carl's art. He's used poetry and literature as part of his visual art practice for 35 years. Carl was born in Sidcup, which I, I know well as a denizen of South London myself. Um, he then moved to, and he grew up really in Sweden and has been influenced by uh, the religious and philosophical perspectives of many cultures, not least his Chinese and Indian heritage. At the same time, he has a deep connection with English history, arts and culture. Largely self-taught, he has not followed a formal or academic artistic pathway. Well, ain't that just like Blake, Carl? That's, yeah. that's, that's a recommendation in many ways. Instead, he has chosen an experimental and exper experiential journey of self-learning by collaborating with artists and researchers on topics as he strives to understand the human condition. Thank you so much, Carl, for joining us at this uh, unearthly hour in your part of the world. I still don't understand the nature of time, um, but uh, it's absolutely brilliant to have you with us. So over to you. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Stephen, for that really warm welcome. I don't know whether you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. Um, and also thanks to Ian because he's going to be doing um, he's going to be doing the slides for me today, and I'm just locking that out now so I can see everything. Um, yeah. So again, thanks Ian for doing all of that for me. Um, First off, I, I thought it would be helpful if I tell you a little bit about myself and my work, um, just to get a feel <clears throat> and a bit of background. Um, in 2012, I was invited by the School of Politics at the University of Surrey to share my art with leading analysts and policymakers and a poster session for their workshop on new capabilities and international intervention. I talked about hidden fantasies, such as the US military's anthropomorphic projection of their uh, romantic and sexual urges onto drone technology, as in this painting of a wedding cake titled, There is Nothing Like a Drone, uh, which is a play on the song from the musical South Pacific. My art's been used on book covers, for example, here's a 2008 um, Canadian Arts Journal about the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. My drone wedding cake became a um, 2017 cover for a book by Kyle Grayson, the head of the School of Geography, Politics and Sociology at Newcastle University. My painting, Australia Prophecy, will be published in, uh, in, in an article in the print edition of the journal Critical Military Studies. But today um, I'll give you even more insights, for example, how my imaginary conversation with Orc guided my painting. So in 2021, I held up William Blake's poem, America, a Prophecy, as a mirror to understand the um, political and military tensions unfolding in the Indo-Pacific. I was disturbed that uh, war, is an inevitable rite of passage for any society that values its masculinity. I see Blake's England, uh, uh, rather, I see Blake as England's conscience. He's really a symbol for uh, an Englishness not completely whitewashed. We're often told how Blake's voice was too strange or too uh, accented with this strangeness to be accepted by the establishment of his time Blake's conscience matters to me <clears throat> because it's this crucial uh, counterpoint to England's colonial history. I may be born in England, but that's not enough to be English. William Blake's flawed, feared, lonely soul, Orc, striving for something beyond himself, breaking the best furniture in the house for just a few minutes of love, 
that's relatable to me. So um, this is what I did in Australia's pandemic lockdowns. I was um, cleaning out some old storage boxes and I found six, seven by five inch canvas canvases painted for my uh, 2013 show. And I'd stored them away because, you know, they just didn't make sense back then. Um, they were screen printed with pages from the Book of Revelation and iconic images from the 20th century, such as the lovers from the Hollywood musical South Pacific. I, um, I sort of pulled these canvases out of storage and instinctively arranged them into a crucifix. And then I found another 10 canvases. Uh, these old canvases acted like uh, a sourdough starter for an exploration of messianic masculine imagery emerging in the Indo-Pacific where I live. There was this religious fervour among conservative leaders in both Australia and China from 2019, which reminded me of Orc's self-righteous anger, and that's where the red undercoat came in. In the end, I painted over the Venetian red, letting it bleed into the final painting. I couldn't, you know, make out Blake's handwriting very well at first, so I used a transcript back in 2011. I'm much better at reading it now. Um, I loved his artwork and his handwritten fonts. I studied typography in the early 1980s, and his penmanship here, it's what we used to call tonking it in which is, um, you know, drawing newsprint and design layouts in a, in a very fast painterly way to quickly work out your ideas before we had computers. I was moved by his uh, uneven, asymmetrical verbal imagery and the light and shadow in his drawings. It, it did take patience for me to break through the pain barrier of 18th century poetry until I gave up and just let the emotions tell the story. And that's when the three, 3D printer sort of kicked in and Blake's characters and stories really popped out in real time. On the surface, it's, a, it's an illustrated poem about the American colonies' War of Independence from Britain in the 18th century. The language is emotional, uh, religious, passionate, and quite sexual. While still clothed in the traditional garment of 18th century Christianity, it, it covers uh, empire, war, suffering, and political oppression with the intercession of angels and other supernatural forces. At the centre of his narrative is an angry, sorrowful, passionate man-god character called Orc. On the one hand, Orc embodies the spirit of rebellion of the American wars of 1775 to 83, but Orc speaks more personally to me about um, British colonization. We keep forgetting America is a former colony because, you know, it now wears the costume of empire. But if we time travel orc straight from the 18th century, there's a question mark over his whiteness because he sees himself as the other. In my imaginary conversations, uh, orc's ambiguous ethnicity, it leaves the door open to Englishness for me that other English literature doesn't. Orc gave me my insights into the culture of masculine violence in our international relations, our leaders search for personal salvation in their hero's journey, and their capacity to distinguish between true and false prophets. And I, I don't see that going away too soon. So, um, so I was drawn to talk to Orc about the political and military tensions in the Indo-Pacific because, you know, his hero's journey is as bleak as the news feeds on my phone. If he is a god, then he defies box ticking. He feels closer to Hindu, Chinese, and many indigenous mythologies where, you know, the face of God speaks in many forms. The preludium that you see here at the beginning of America, a prophecy it was a bit of a shock for me, to be honest. You don't expect sex, religion, and politics at an 18th century dinner table to be so graphic. Um, <clears throat> Blake's heterosexuality, it's also going to change my translation. I, I think Blake's poem has a sense of muscularity, which you can see here. The poem has uh, confronting imagery, the hairy use, 
the terrible boy and the cries of the dark virgin. When Orc breaks free from his chains, post-colonial cultures recognise that despair and relief as their own. I recognise that. Part of my thought experiment involves sitting opposite Orc in a chair for hours. You begin to see a man chained to a version of masculinity that is violent, traumatised and unhealed. So Orc became the one person who might tell me if our archetypes of war are inescapable. Why must we accept the Thucydides trap? You know, this Ivy League mythology that policy analysts are pushing to drive up tensions in the Indo-Pacific. Thucydides' 5th century BC text is suggesting to us that when an emerging great power threatens a declining power, vassal state politics and, and fear-driven military escalation will make war inevitable. This blockbuster movie, Elevator Pitch of the Peloponnesian Wars, wants us to believe that war between America and China is hereditary. It's a, it's a fatalistic use of history where all roads lead to war, and it answers the question from my journal article, do our hidden narratives shape our response to an existential threat or create them? Orc understood Thucydides' analogy very well in one of our 3 a.m. chats, but it triggered his PTSD, and he had to sit down on a bench and deep breathe. A lot of William Blake's drawings of Orc resemble different stages of an anxiety attack. PTSD in policy is something that we don't talk about either. As nations, we carry historically traumatic stories. As citizens, we subconsciously absorb those stories. And men of war and politics seem to instinctively run towards conflict or towards their abyss in search of their inner hero. And since the time of Blake, this archetypal journey has become embedded in many of our institutional cultures, including our military. It's become a, a sort of celebrated pathway for both religious and secular men to express their masculinity. One does not need to finish the journey, but men expect other men to be on the hero's journey. And I talk about this in my journal article. Masculinity and male violence is as rarely discussed in international intervention as the hidden cultural, religious and gender narratives we absorbed through our national cultures. Orc became a muse for my painting. Um, confiding in him helped me to resist that quietly aggressive censorship that comes your way when you ask complex or unpopular questions. He helped me to engage with masculine pain, like taking a splinter from a dog's paw this can be a dangerous process, but it can pay off if you can earn their trust. Orc would say interesting things to me like, Carl, the king isn't afraid of me politically. He's afraid of me psychologically and supernaturally. I'm the irrational and the impossible. I'm this existential threat to everything England wants to be and do. And, and I would ask him, you mean like colonisation? He didn't answer everything I asked. Instead, he quoted Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. As a god, my violence has a cosmic purpose. But as a man, I'm just violent. Orc's moral ambiguity made me question the hero archetype. I don't think we need to be religious or have read Revelation to, you know, appreciate that online or in our own heads, false prophets are more common than not. And by this time, Orc and I had settled into a routine of meeting for drinks after work in a bar on Smith Street in Melbourne. I showed him my articles on my phone while explaining the history of Sino-Australian relations. Blake's poem was sort of niggling me to look beyond my phone as Australian and Chinese relations began to nosedive. Orc's sadness, his uh, depression, made me think. When a hero believes that they've failed to slay their dragon, win their treasure, and return to their community to pay off everyone's mortgage, they seem compelled to return to the dark, to the abyss, and the search for redemption. The problem is, it's no longer just their abyss, it's ours. 
and it's on our phones. Orc's voice was saying, you see your world through tiny boxes. I've heard those words before. Washington, Payne, the King of England. Um, they're all the same. Good men do bad things, bad men do good things. Most people do nothing. I get really tired of being Orc, big, fearsome, heroic. At this stage in the painting, my new feeds are starting to vibrate with subconscious stories. I saw this meta-narrative of archetypal masculine violence fed by the same traumas that Orc was going through, splitting up into little boxes, into little stories on our phones, trying to stay hidden in the dark. You know, Nietzsche, it's, it's not really my thing, but I can appreciate his advice when he says, battle not with monsters, lest you become a monster. And if you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes into you. Our mobile phones are doorways into our collective abyss. Orc told me, we see life through these tiny boxes. He's right. We're losing the ability to see these subconscious stories sitting behind the headlines on our phones, like AUKUS, the trilateral security agreement between to share nuclear submarines and other technology between Australia, the UK and the US. Like um, white noise, you know, we, we see instead oversimplified stories about Athens and Sparta in ancient Greece, Soviet Cold War thrillers, and how World War II was the West's good war because we won. Since 2019, the vocal narratives coming from China's President Xi Jinping through his, you know, wolf warrior diplomats, and from Australia by a former Special Forces soldier and recent Australian Deputy Minister for Defence, Andrew Hastie, have both contributed to painting a rhetorical political landscape in the region, e evoking a misplaced nostalgia for World War II and nazi soviet era conflicts of the past. From the Chinese side, I mean, you know, we all feel for their trauma of 100 years of humiliation. It's mirrored by Australia's yellow peril fears, which uh, inspired the white Australia policy at the start of our federation. But, you know, building islands outside of your great walls, that's like moving a dance party into your neighbor's bedroom past midnight. When we don't acknowledge trauma, it wields greater control over us. Trauma enters the briefing rooms of great powers and sets the end game for us all. And that scares me as an artist and as a human being. To listen to complex cultural historical narratives reduced to a two minute Hollywood elevator pitch on social media, that's scary for people of Asian and Pacific ancestry right now. Thucydides wasn't writing from the perspective of civilian victims of war. My parents were children of World War II, um, traumatised forever by the duration and aftermath of war. For most people, World War II was never a good war. Surely we can tell better stories. So I returned to my studio and these oceans between each small canvas. I saw a vast sub emotional subconscious which connects and separates all 14 different cultures in the Indo-Pacific. With these insights, the painting slowly came together over several months. Here's the finished painting. Um, the reason why I, I chose this heavy and ornate gold frame was because I wanted to accentuate the religious Religiosity of the painting because Blake's understanding of God remains uh, a counterpoint to his political visions. Let's take a closer look now at those smaller stories sitting around the crucifix. Um, there's a lot of 22 karat gold leaf in this painting. Here I've embellished the Chinese jet fighter incursions into Taiwanese airspace. Gold has held a spiritual significance for millennia, and these jets remind me of angels descending from heaven. The distinction between an angel and a jet fighter is really, I think, up to which passport you're carrying on the day. 
Australian artist Sidney Nolan's 1940s painting, The Bush Ranger Ned Kelly, have become iconic and inseparable from Australian identity. Several panels have drowning Ned Kellys, expressing the emotional despair and fear at the heart of masculine violence. They also question the role that the white Australia policy has had on how the AUKUS agreement is being experienced by Indo-Pacific nations. These simplistic black figures made me wonder too if Orc is Blake's poem, The Little Black Boy, all grown up, but, you know, very enraged because the king is the only father he knows is a representative of heaven on earth. My conversation with Orc evolved. He went from being the angry son driven to violence by pain and rage into a voice searching for new and better stories. To the right of the canvas, nuclear submarines render visible the AUKUS agreement between Australia, the US and the UK, which has increased fear in the Indo-Pacific. They move stealthily towards our Christian Messiah as he stared at the dogs of war beneath his feet. Submarines will save us. I will save us. I am AUK. I am God. I wasn't worried about specific models of nuclear submarines. Art isn't a technical manual. But they're the basic shape that speaks to people that says submarine and nuclear. They float above Hasty and Jinping like a thought bubble. The sound of the first half of the acronym AUKUS includes my friend AUK, AUK US. It's funny how our, you know, our fictional stories, they, they just strive to survive the human tendency to forget. My characters are really influenced by early American primitives, the folk art portraits of English colonists from the 18th century. I, um, I see Xi's smoking jacket as his 20th century mask of, I don't really care, when in fact, his blood pressure is probably quite out there. Hasty gazes directly at the viewer. Xi never looks directly at us, but he hears everything. They are separated by age, position, history, ethnicity, perhaps face, but united in their invocations of past conflicts and masculine violence as a roadmap to the future. I took the, uh, the Nordic symbol they call the Vegvisir and dismantled it. It's not supposed to work unless it remains in a circle. I turned it into a gold leaf tattoo on Hasty's forehead to invoke a broken navigation system. Also to reflect on the book of Revelation's prophecy about false prophets. In other words, both Hasty and Jinping and, in, and indeed all political and military leaders may be having messianic visions to justify their policies, but can they ever be really sure where they come from? If I was to name each individual pa panel in this painting, I would probably name this one the men's room. Do masculine messiahs just want to be liked? We play a role in creating messiahs from our social media. In isolation, we spend too much time online feeding our intellectual and emotional sovereignty to whoever Facebook, Twitter or Instagram tell us to. The like button is now so ubiquitous, it doesn't bear explanation, but it seemed fitting like the hands of Jesus to hammer it into the center of Xi's hand as he waves to us from the royal we. What makes us like ourselves? Um, I wrote in my article that men of war and politics instinctively run towards conflict or towards their abyss in search of their inner hero to express their masculinity. I think they like that. Uh, what they don't plan or expect to confront and what they uh, really don't like is Carl Jung's concept of the shadow. After the confetti washes off, our heroes discover that they are still too human. And this is the point where the Messiah archetype becomes most seductive for our national leaders. And it's at this critical time for the Indo-Pacific, and I think this may apply to Europe too. 
that we must be so cautious in how we curate the personal, cultural, and mythological stories that inspire us to act. Female energy is really under attack right now. I mean, one could say that the goddess is being oppressed. Their basic human rights silenced from America to Iran. There's something about Christian Dior's iconic 1947 New Look collection that says France to me. Reflecting on the current AUKUS agreement once again, Australia dumping its submarine contract with France felt like those classic film noir movies of the 1950s, where this uh, beautiful, stylish lady is done wrong by a charming, sexy, but criminally narcissistic chauvinist who has lied about simply everything, darling. Don't you just love those old movies? Orc could not look me in the eye when I brought up the goddess. I mean, I don't expect a post-feminist response from Orc or from any man of war. I get it. He's on a mission to save his colonial brethren. He is Orc. He is God. I get it. But I persisted. He's from my imagination, unlike real life. So I think I can really change this guy. And by the end of the painting, you know, he's realised that grief, shag or not, consent matters. The consent of the people, it should matter to prime ministers, presidents, generals, ministers of defence, but most importantly, it should matter to us. Really, don't you think? I like this next panel um, quite a bit. It sits right above the, the head of Jesus on the crucifix. It has all the elements overlapping each other and, and more gold. In these older canvases, I, uh, I merged the seal of the Knights Templar from the Middle Ages with uh, the logo of the National Security Agency in the US, or the NSA, to create this sigil. Because these two agencies really share the same mythology of a crusading messiah. In donning this camouflage of traditional Christianity, Blake's poem reflects much of the patriarchal religious allegory that appears in military culture. Stories of oppression, which justify violent retribution, filter less emotionally into military rules of engagement and international law. Heroes like Orc are allowed to practice violence in the name of bigger causes or a higher calling, such as the protection of the motherland or human rights violations. But at what point do our shadows step away from us, assume their own autonomy and take control of us? There are many messiahs in many religions, even more if you count, you know, heroes and and, and saviors from our mythologies, novels, movies, and songs and music. I mean, we haven't stopped doing this. I was inspired by Diego Velasquez's 1632 painting, Christ Crucified, with the exception of his white dogs. Jesus stares at the dogs of war beneath his feet in despair. I am Orc. The Orc is here. God gave us Orc. These cries cover the crucifix like um, the graffiti and street art in our urban landscapes. Do the defenders of our faith today, our security agencies, elite soldiers and ruling parties in every nation also fight for Christ's legacy? Or have the false prophets from Revelation already impregnated them with deep fakes? On the practical side, here you see how I, I painted on top of these canvases after I'd attached them onto a flat board. So the whole process added a lot of weight. Painting Jesus then brought all the threads together spiritually for me. He was one of the last elements on the painting. Orc didn't want a recognisable Jesus. He wanted himself, hairy back and all. I said, sorry. I respect your pain. You want to help us. I see that now. But you are not God. He disappeared after that. 
I think he felt misunderstood and betrayed. Ork didn't understand that while I gained empathy, I still disagreed with his version of masculine violence. And I, I think I failed to convince him that masculinity doesn't need violence to exist. But I'll never know. Perhaps he's disappeared into my subconscious again, and I'll have to hope that our friendship survives his disappointment. In Orc's absence, I'll always have the voices of poets from our century to Blake's to remind me of our time together. Around the border of my crucifix, I painted extracts from two poems by a wonderful American poet, A. Van Jordan, which merge into Blake's poem, America of Prophecy. I'll read them. Sound, sound, my loud war trumpets. The empire is no more, and now the lion and wolf shall cease. I escaped from Westworld, the amusement park for adults, or maybe it never existed, though I do remember a vivid weekend there and shooting a man. Perhaps his non-belief makes him a hero. Perhaps, without insecurity, he seemed less believable as a man. As spiritual metaphor, William Blake's poetry remains very alive to me, helping me to separate historical fact from false prophecies. Thanks for inviting me to share my perspective with you through my painting today, Australia of Prophecy. If there's any questions, I'm, I'm really happy to answer them. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Carl. That was, uh, <clears throat> that was such a beautiful thing. I find that so funny, so moving, and so insightful on so many levels. Um, you sort of, for me, you're identifying what Northrop Fry called the orc cycle, where orc turns into the oppressor. It goes from revolution to oppressor and the colonizer in, in terms of your, your discourse here. Or the colonized at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yes, yeah, yeah. It's I mean, he's coloured red, isn't he, or something in the poem. So it's... That's right. The hand that crushed the tyrant's head became a tyrant in its stead, as uh, Blake says in The um, in the Grey Monk. Blake liked to use a lot of gold as well. Um, in his I didn't painting. know. With, yeah, with yeah. Like, the, gold, the gold leaf. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's really hard to work with. Uh, it's very delicate, and and um, and if you're on a windy day, you know, fifty dollars could just fly away into the wind. Uh, <laughs> Going to say it's not cheap and cheerful, is it? It's, <laughs> well, it's really nice to to work with, but it's very expensive. Yeah, absolutely. We have some questions from the floor. There's something very nice been written in the uh, chat by Ramazan, our, um, our member from Turkey. He's, oh. Perhaps he'd like to talk to, talk to you yeah. directly. I'd love that. Ramazan, you there? Oh, he's got to leave, he says. Oh, <laughs> yeah, very interesting presentation. Wonderful. He needs to leave. He's a little under the weather. So he'll watch the rest on me. YouTube. Good night, everyone. Um, yeah, congratulations. That's all good. Yeah. So questions, comments yes. from the floor. Oh, as a raised hand from Anise. Anise Rogers. There she is. Uh, you're muted, Anise. Yes, you can hear him now. Um, that was amazing. Absolutely um, brilliant art. I really loved it. And I, I, I could completely see the the contemporary and the Blake all mixed together. So that was that was amazing. Um, I actually just wanted to boringly talk about colour. Um, I I really um, loved that your Messiah Christ figure um, was painted in that lovely blue, which is almost like the opposite of orc. Orc is always painted in the red and and the, yes. the orange and the the, the flame colours, like the the war colours, if you like. Um, and whether you'd done that on purpose to show like the opposite side of masculinity. As in complementary colours. <laughs> um, no, I think the blue thing, um, 
you know, I, I sometimes have a thing with the blue, with the Hindu, with a lot of Hindu representation and trying to sort of, um, I don't know, making making Jesus blue was about making him more multicultural, I suppose, and more relevant to me. Um, personally, you know, I didn't think, you know, when you're painting, you don't think about the viewer, you're very selfish, you know, <laughs> what does this mean to me? Um, so yeah, that had a, that, that thing of the blue, there's a lot of blue figures of Krishna and, and in, in a lot of the faith that I follow, there's like a traditional line, lineage from Krishna to Jesus, um, with, with the, in terms of, you know, the spiritual lineage of those gurus. So yeah, so that was why I did the blue, <laughs> Um, can I just expand slightly and ask another question? <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Um, no, um, I, I love all the like the Hindu connections because I actually know it's really well with Blake and the idea of like the emanations and the various um, different versions of Albion. Um, the question I was going to ask was along those lines, and I've completely forgotten. So I'm going okay. to wait and ask his first <laughs> and see if I can remember it. <laughs> It'll come back. Jason, you're on. Jason has a question for you. Thank you. Um, fantastic. I love the painting and the talk was absolutely amazing. So uh, my, my question, which I could just drag out for a long time. Um, <laughs> what do you make, uh, or do you have an opinion on Blake's later works and particularly his, for me, it's always seemed that Blake's opinions of kind of masculinity and violence change after 1803, when he turns from Feldham, so when he's writing Milton, a poem, and Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, which are also the works where Orc effectively disappears. So Orc rarely appears in those later works. And I, I just wonder if you had any comments on Blake's own later attitudes towards masculinity and violence. Could you just repeat that in bit? You broke up a little bit. Sorry. Um, so. Uh, the, the, the question was, do you have any comments on Blake's attitudes in his later works to masculinity and violence? I have to be honest, I'm not an expert. I mean, everyone's read the Jerusalem, but uh, you're right. I do, I do notice the disappearance. Yeah. Uh, I don't read a lot of the critical theory around it, I suppose. I, I've always wanted to just have my own relationship <laughs> to, to yes. work. But... But I, the, what what little I have read has commented on that disappearance or that that you know um, I think they, there was some comments in some of the things that I've read about his disillusionment uh, in um, of what to call it radical radical re rebellious kind of causes you know. And I can really re I can relate to that because I, I work as a I work as a community advocate, multicultural, anti-racist, counter-terrorism with the Muslim, you know, all of that. It's really dark, you know. And um, I think when you start off, I'm not saying I'm I understand William Blake because of my life, and you know, I'm not drawing that kind of analogy. But I can understand it's very hard to keep that kind of anger going because, I mean, Orc is so intense, you know. Um, I just finished reading Prince Harry's book and I just thought, whoa, you are so under the influence of Orc right now. <laughs> you know? um, pure, just that incredible pain and anger. You can't sustain that for long. It's not sustainable. And I, I think of the narrative, I can imagine as an artist when he got to that point towards getting older as well. I mean, I've been doing this for nearly 40 years. So you know, I used to be able to, one, one painting, I, I spent 16 hours straight and I just collapsed in my, in, like I was 30 years old. I couldn't do that now. So I think partly it could be exhaustion. It could have been Blake's, the physicality of trying to, to you create a fictional character, but it's, you know, you're living it. When you, when you create something and, and it's got emotion, I mean, you kind of, you, you, you walk with that feeling. It's, it's a very, you know, it can be a, Psycho that's why a lot of artists go nuts, to be quite honest, because no one cares about our mental health. You have to kind of create your own material data safety sheet about the whole process. <laughs> um, so I can imagine that if he wanted to keep going, and don't forget he'd been, you know, um, accused of sedition and put on trial. And, um, yeah, like in Australia, it's really dangerous to question a lot of these things. I mean, I, I think a lot of the time I'm, I'm metaphorical because 
our MPs take people, activists to court by having an opinion. I mean, it's, there is no free speech anymore. So we live in a lot of similar times to, to William Blake. So, and, and art's very good for that. But, I mean, I don't, that doesn't answer your question because I can't walk no, 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 in no. shoes. But, I, you know, just, just, just living with Orc yes. <laughs> or, or having this relationship with Orc, it's really intense and you just want to send them off to bloody therapist, to be quite honest. <laughs> um, I, I'd just say, if, if you ever do return to life after Orc, um, <laughs> the later works, I, I think that, that some of the comments you're making about masculinity and violence, I think Blake directly addresses those, some of those very explicitly from a kind of a, an increasingly pacifist view in his later works. He, he, he deliberately turns his back on it for a whole host of reasons. I, and I think there's traces of that in his early yeah. work as well. Yes. Um, and that's why I think of him as England's conscience. And, and it's, it kind of ties into this sort of identity crisis I'm going through with yeah, I'm going through a bit of identity crisis too because I left I left England at such a young age, and we went to Sweden, and then we ended up in Australia and travelled around. And I haven't, I you know, I've gone back, I go back on holidays. Or I don't live there, and and um, you know, the last couple of years, England just sounds really weird because it's like the tabloids are your foreign policy, it's not the government. It's the tabloids. It's like, do you know that your tabloids are running your foreign policy? Um, and it makes, you know, the Commonwealth and then the Queen died and it was really sad and it kind of made you feel like, yeah, so, so going back to the painting, I think I was going through that as well. But, but latching, on to, um, latching on to William Blake, there's so much good in what he does. And I just used to think that the thought was, gee, I wish he was here now. And what would he say? And, and that's when I got into this imaginary thing and we're out and we're having a drink and he def his character was definitely, you know, sometimes it was Orc and then I pretty much, I didn't talk about it, but it's a bit like there was Orc and his sidekick, you know, it was like one of these top shows. And they're both traveling, they're both sort of jumped into 2021 from the past and, and they're just looking around going, what have you done? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Again, I'm not answering your question. No, no, no. Thank you. This is great. Great. Uh, fantastic talk. Absolutely. I love the painting. Thank I'm really you. glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Yes. I didn't scare anyone away. I thought I'm right. <laughs> you say you've been at it for 40 years, Carl, but you look much too young to me for somebody at three in the morning, four in the morning now, and <laughs> counting, heading for five. John has a has a, yes. uh, a question or a comment. Hi, John. Thanks, Stephen. And hi, Carl. Um, really enjoyed the talk. That was fascinating. Oh, um, I just was really amused just now as well by your your um, picking up on uh, Prince Harry's book. I love the idea we talk about Orc as being the angry um, red boy, hairy red boy. You know, it's perfect. <laughs> um, I think there's something really interesting and like very Blakey in in the way you uh, approach uh, the way you, the way you describe your painting and the, and the sort of processes that you were using in it, um, both in the way you're you're sort of using uh Blake's character uh as an element and and to take that forward but also you're you're kind of doing a similar or following a similar impulse as he did in the first place with America for example I think in the that sort of using existing mythology to try and understand like psychologically what's going on behind global events but then but then also like re-mythologizing them yourselves like taking uh, these real uh, characters in global politics and kind of folding them back into the into your mythological narrative, I think is fascinating. Um, but my question really was, slightly follows on from what Jason was asking, I suppose, is uh, are you going to continue having these late night drinking sessions with Orc or, or are you done with him? Can you sort of see this going forward in a creative way and continuing with Blake and Orc or... Or is that it? Oh, he's never going to go away because I, I, I am just a really, I, I specialize in dysfunctional relationships with, with, with mentally unstable men. So he's just always going to be there, you know. Um, yeah. So, uh, he's, and you know, I'm kind of hoping, you know, the point is, um, you know, every time I, doing this process and then looking at the world and the news and this, and then, you know, doing this painting and the process, and then looking at the news again, you know, where it's all going with what's happening in Europe and the way it's kind of getting worse. I, I just am so convinced that you can't, 
<clears throat> you can't fight that. You can't fight and deny. They will not be denied. That orc anger, that 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 energy, that that masculine violence, it cannot be uh, suppressed. It needs to be. It needs to be um, heard and listened to. And all that pain inside them needs to be listened to. And and I just don't think we. You kind of realize, you know, and I maybe that's why maybe that's what Blake got disillusioned, you know, because revolution, you know, going violence breeds violence. You know, you go, you're a masculine violent man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna become a masculine and I'm gonna, you know, do this to you. And you just realize when you're in close proximity with with people who are who have that idea of manhood that the only way to get them to dismantle that shell is by engaging with it and not shutting it down, not cancelling it. And it's very difficult to sit in the room. I thought I said I sit for hours opposite. And um, maybe I can do that because of my work listening to people who are always traumatised. <laughs> so I've developed a bit of that resistance. But I do know from experience that, that you do need to listen to them. You can't just tune them off and say, go to your room or go into the corner they'll come back from the corner with a chair and they'll hit you <laughs> so um we have to find a better way to listen to the orcs in the world i guess mm. i <laughs> would love to see where you <laughs> i think so yeah and I, I would love to see where you go with it next and and with with orc or any other aspects of the sort of blakian mythology well um yeah uh, he hasn't disappeared he hasn't disappeared it's um i think that the little this idea I, I mentioned this idea of the little black boy that's grown up <laughs> into a walk. And and um, you know, there was the other question um about uh Blake's later work, letting go of orc. And I think that's that's there's like it's not that he disappears, it's that he resolves it and he becomes a different part of the landscape, which is the optimistic way of looking at it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. You've been drinking with Orc, Carl. I've been dating Vela, Blake's shadowy female. I haven't told anybody till now. Now you all know. Um, I do hope that you do further your explorations of Blake. I know we've chatted about that a bit. And this it does cue us up for the, the Blake uh, uh, Blake Society um, journal, Vela, um, yeah. because you, you've hit the war and peace theme, um, which That's is... That's your theme, isn't it? Is something that is the theme for this year for this year's journal. So uh, that's that's really interesting. Bravissimo says Melissa, oh. and Anise has a question for you. Yes, she's remembered. Start your video, Anise. Yes, she's uh, she's a member. Oh, yes, she's I've remembered. Someone. There you are. Oh, good. I've re I've remembered. Um, it was the idea of um, you, you were talking about the the Hindu. Um, ideas of and, and I was especially thinking um of of, of like Kali and the idea that, that you can be both um like the evil and the good part at the same you can be the opposites. Um and obviously um in some Blakey mythology the orc is a manifestation of Luva who is like the opposite of orc um who in the four Zoas gets crucified. So it is is sort of it's when I looked at your picture, it was almost like I was seeing the whole of Orc, including Luva, at the same time. And I just wondered whether that was what you were seeing, like both both parts uh, or multiple parts of yes. Orc. I don't think you engage with someone that initially comes across as what Orc does. I mean, Orc doesn't follow the traditional Joseph Campbell hero's journey, you know, like, like there isn't a resolution at the end. So it's not like a simple ABC departure, initiation, return formula. He doesn't return because you're kind of stuck at, he's stuck in the abyss. <clears throat> um, and I think like this idea of the, the moral ambiguity of the hero, that to me is really that's another way of putting this idea that the good and the bad are two sides of the same coin. <clears throat> and it comes down to this idea of, you know, heaven and hell, God and the devil, God and Satan. And I think those those things, I think Blake really does play with that. He really plays with the, like, good turns into bad, turns back into good. 
it's 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 very hard to nail down what is right and wrong, good and bad, light and dark. And that's, I think, I mean, I really think that, uh, I think when I first started talking to Stephen, you were saying, uh, oh, Blake, and you were saying, um, what did you say? You said something about, well, you know, we're not... It's it's not like we're not as big as Shakespeare and Jane Austen. I mean, they've just really taken off on the planet. But Blake is really like this is a really good time for Blake, I think, because of Blake's ability to deal with complexity in a, in a Western frame, in a in a white in a yeah in a white Western Christian framework that doesn't deal with complexity really well. It it splits everything in dualities: right, wrong, black, white. The, I brought up the Thucydides. Uh, trap because it's a lot of people like to go um yes no um, like war is a simple uh, inevitable duality and and there's no other options and and this idea of consent is tied to the fact that you know they started talking about a problem and we've gone straight to war so as citizens we've not been consulted because they have not thought of any other options there's been no other thinking about what could be an alternative to war <laughs> Um, so I think Blake has a lot to say to address that, you know. I, I would often, it would be interesting to hear what people say about Blake, uh, Orc, or, or William Blake, and, and what's happening in Europe right now. Yeah, I think you you, you, you show it really well with your, when, you, when you were talking about um, your aeroplane or your fighter jets being like angels, um, because that that really did i think a metal like being a matter of perspective but being both at the same time um you you've really got what blake was trying to say i think yeah I, and i think um it would be just fascinating it would be fascinating to to see what i don't know what 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 orc had to say from a european perspective wouldn't it We can go to Europe, a prophecy for that. Um, Tim, would you like to come back in at this point? There he is. Uh, thank you, Carl, for a wonderful talk. I remember oh, talking you. once to the Blake curator at the Tate and Robin Hamlin, Tate Gallery in London, and he was saying that regardless of any other aspect of Blake, Blake should be known as a great colorist. And I think your wonderful painting has that similar quality of color. Well, thank and you. I hope it finds a great home wherever it ends up. Well, well Blake and I are still, uh, unfortunately, traveling the same economic road. <laughs> so I'd like I, I to... so diverge at some point from Blake's reality into something a little bit more, yeah. But yeah, thank you, that's a great thought. <laughs> And I think what a wonderful tribute to Orc and indeed to Blake to get a work into critical military strategy studies. I think it's, you know, a wonderful, seditious place to put an article about Blake. It is. It's a fantastic journal. And, and the editor has been really lovely. And, and, and I, Victoria and I had another editor in, in, uh, in Finland at the same time. Uh, which is obviously very difficult. It was right at the time when 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 they were really well. They're still worried about uh, Russia, but but she did a terrific job. They both helped me so much, and the, the, I had to write two thousand words for that. And I think a lot of this came from that. Um, actually, you know, I never intended to go into such depths of explaining this painting. I, I was in my head, but I never. Uh, obviously, I, I loved sharing it with the journal, but the condition was 2,000 words. It was either that or nothing, you know, so they needed the 2,000 words, and that nearly killed me, and I finally got that out of me. So this has actually been really nice because I've been able to uh, bring in some of the slightly more offbeat that wouldn't work in a 2,000-word article in an academic journal to bring in this, uh, I guess, this fictitious... Uh, imaginary conversation. Um, so I'm really grateful for you giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. So our final thanks to Carl and to everyone who's attended tonight. And I'd just like to say um, congratulations to Sibylla on becoming the new chair. She's a difficult act to proceed. So 
I wish everyone good night and we'll see you again in February for our next event. Good night, everyone. <laughs>